Shabbat Shalom. Our scripture reading for this morning is from Numbers 6, 1 through 8, and Judges 14 through 14, verse 20. Again, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When a man or woman makes a special vow, namely the vow of a Nazarite, to live as a Nazarite for the Lord. He shall abstain from wine and strong drink. He shall consume no vinegar, whether made from wine or strong drink, nor shall he drink any grape juice, nor eat fresh or dried grapes. All the days of his consecration, he shall not eat anything that is produced from the grape vine, from the seeds even to the skin. All the days of his vow of consecration, no razor shall pass over his head. He shall be holy until the days are fulfilled, which he lives as a Nazarite for the Lord. He shall let the locks of hair of his head grow long. All the days of his life as a Nazarite for the Lord, he shall not come up to a dead person. He shall not make himself unclean for his father or for his mother, for his brother or for his sister when they die, because his consecration to God is on his head. All the days of his consecration, he is holy to the Lord. In Judges 14, verse 20, but Samson's wife was given to his companion, who he had been his friend. It's so great to see all the different people that serve here. It's, it blows me away. And then to see the Allens. We miss you all. Thanks for being here today. And I want to thank somebody else for being here today, too. Uh, you all might know him. Some of you might not. Uh, he was instrumental in helping our search team find a, a new pastor as uh, Pastor Dan was preparing to retire. So he worked with us for two years to find Amer. And we are blessed because of it. Uh, Jared Hall is his name. He's a great teacher and preacher. His day job is at Moody Bible Institute. He's a stewardship representative and the director of the Alumni Association Coaching Initiative. He serves on the board of directors at Life and Messiah Ministries. He provides itinerant preaching and leadership coaching throughout the Midwest. And that's why he's here today, to itinerantly preach to us. He completed his undergrad at Moody and his master's at Moody Theological Seminary. His wife, Melissa, and he have three sons. And this, I think, is the most interesting part about Jared. He named his three sons Blaze, Hudson, and Steele. We'll have to talk to him about that later to find out more. In his free time, he likes coaching eighth grade basketball. I'm guessing one of those guys is in eighth grade. Yeah? No? None of them is. Just eighth grade basketball is your thing. Yeah, I've just been doing it for 20 years. All right. Yeah. Please welcome Jared. Thanks, hey. brother. Alan's, I just want you to know that Craig has never once got weepy at seeing me, and so I'm very jealous of his fondness for you. Uh, I don't have that same thing. Uh, since Pastor Amer has taken over, uh, the beam has gotten messier. I don't know. There's a lot of things going on up here. We'll have to cover that in our next coaching session. Um, Shabbat Shalom. I hope that you guys had a restful Thanksgiving. I did not. Uh, I hosted my in-laws or outlaws based on how Thursday went. 
And, uh, and then my family, yesterday I smoked three turkeys in 24 hours. Um, and so this is the most restful experience I've had. So I'm very grateful to see all of you. It's always a joy and a gift to be at Olive Tree. Uh, the last time that I preached here was Shabbat following Thanksgiving a year ago, which was the last time I saw the Allens. And so I'm actually just continuing where I left off last year. So it's going to be, and then next year when I get, maybe if I get invited back, then we'll finish the series then. So this will be a three-week series drawn out over three years. So I'm, I'm sure all of you remember exactly what I said last time too. So, or you went back and watched it. Well, enough of uh, rambling. Let's pray and we'll get started with today's message. Lord, we thank you so much that there is none like you, that there's none beside you. And as we read, Lord, that you are holy, holy, holy. Lord, we thank you so much for the death and resurrection of Yeshua, that, Lord, we're able to petition you with confidence because he is seated at your right hand. That, Lord, anyone else, they pray with some level of hope, shouting out with pleas and uncertainty. But, Lord, for us as sons and daughters, we can speak to you with confidence. That not only do you hear our words, Lord, but you know our thoughts. That you know us better than ourselves. And Lord, you know what we're in need of today. Lord, where we are in need of correction, instruction, encouragement, of spiritual growth. And I ask, Lord, that as we go into your word today, that you would do exactly that. That you would conform us and transform us more into the image of your Son, Yeshua, our Messiah, it's in his name that we pray. Amen. I wanted to begin this morning by sharing a story about a lady who was going in for a procedure where she had to receive uh, some anesthesia and go under. And anyone who's gone into a procedure like knows it can be a little bit nerve-wracking, right, to go under. And then that experience of coming out and some of that disorientation that comes with it. And on this particular day, the procedure went just fine. And as she was coming out of it in the distance, she could hear some bells ringing from a nearby church. And the light was kind of fuzzy and her vision was kind of fuzzy. And, and in her, her drowsy state, she said, am I... Am I in heaven? And, and the doctor, a bit concerned as she was coming out of the anesthesia, put his hand on her and shook her a little bit. And, no, 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 Mary. No, Mary. You're, you're, you're with us. And she goes, oh, Dr. Brown, I can't be heaven if you're here. Oh. I don't know how you feel about your doctor, but I felt that way about a few of mine. Can you imagine the disappointment that she felt in that moment? thinking that she was about to be in the presence of Jesus just to be reminded that, ah, oh, right here on earth. Anyone ever been disappointed before? Anybody? Good. Anybody who didn't put their hands up just don't like to participate, I guess. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Disappointment strikes all of us at some point or another. The question is, is does disappointment define you? Sometimes disappointment's just that, a moment and it's gone, and we move on. For some of us, though, there is a disappointment or a series of disappointments that continues to shape and influence the way that we see everyday life, the way that we see the relationships around us, the way that we see ourselves. And it's pretty easy for some of us to think, you know what, if I just accomplished this or I accomplished that, then I wouldn't feel what I'm feeling. But as I've dived into some biographies and different things, I've been pretty shocked and surprised to find that even people who I would say were successful still experienced feelings of disappointment. Alexander the Great, who conquered much of the known world, including Persia, after conquering Persia, wrote this. Or it was recorded that he had this response. He broke down and wept because his troops were too exhausted to push on to India. I mean, think about this. This is the guy who influenced 
much of the world today, he had successfully spread the Greek language, Greek thought, Greek sports. I mean, the reason why anybody ever been in a gymnasium before, right? That's all thanks to Alexander the Great. But at the moment that he couldn't continue on to India, his result was what? Disappointment. Felt like a failure. Wept. No rejoicing. No celebration. Another gentleman, John Quincy Adams, the sixth president of the United States. He's no Lincoln, but he was still the president of the United States. This is what he wrote in his diary. My life has been spent in vain and idle aspirations and in ceaseless rejected prayers that something would be the result of my existence. Wow. Right? I mean, the sixth president of the United States wrote, my life has been spent in vain and idle aspirations. That's disappointment. That is disappointment. And how does this happen? How does our lives become so marked by disappointment? I think it comes down to something we talk a lot about at Life of Messiah, which is our ADEs. Our assumptions, our desires, and our expectations. And that when our assumptions and desires and expectations become aligned with the things of this world or become aligned with our past experiences of disappointment, then we begin to define ourselves very differently. And we can spend our entire life quite miserable. And we can view other people as objects instead of people. And our relationship with God, although we can give lip service to it, really becomes the back seat to what drives our life. Disappointment begins to drive the bus of our life. And I want to take a look at a passage of Scripture where there is a series of disappointments in the way that God breaks through to give us some perhaps clarity and perspective in how best to relate to the Lord and how that should define how we live. So if you have a copy of the scriptures, open up with me to Judges chapter 15. Judges chapter 15. As you're turning there, uh, we covered Samson's background by reading the Nazarite vow. That gives us clarity to what Samson's situation in life is, that he's a man dedicated to the Lord, that he shouldn't touch anything dead, he shouldn't have anything to do with the fruit of the vine, and he shouldn't cut his hair. If you're familiar with Judges 14, which we covered a year ago, he's checked two of those three boxes in breaking his vows. He's not only touched dead bodies, he ripped a lion apart, he killed several Philistines, and he scooped honey out of a lion's carcass and ate it, yuck, and gave it to mom and dad for them to eat, double yuck. So, not sure what you guys did for dessert this holiday. Hopefully it wasn't that. Judges 15. Now, the chapter ends. Samson uh, kills some Philistines. He drops their clothes down back at his wedding. He goes home. His father-in-law gives his bride to be away to the best man, and he goes home to sulk with mom and dad. So really healthy family dynamics there. I feel like my sarcasm is wasted on this Shabbat. I don't know why. I feel like it's just a little flying a little heavy here. First one says this, After some days at the time of wheat harvest, Samson went to visit his wife with a young goat. And he said, I will go in to my wife in the chamber. But her father would not allow him to go in. And her father said, I really thought that you utterly hated her, so I gave her to your companion. Is not her younger sister more beautiful than she? Please take her instead. And Samson said to them, This time I shall be innocent in regard to the Philistines when I do harm to them. Let's pause. So the wheat harvest in Israel takes place in May. So we're only probably a couple weeks, maybe a month after the scene closed in chapter 14. So some time has expired, but not a long time has expired. And notice that Samson has kind of cooled off and he's decided that he wants to go back to his wife. And what does he do? He takes a young goat to her. Gentlemen, Make a note in the margin of your Bible. Regardless of what your wife's love language is, a young goat will not make up for such things. 
as killing 30 men and dropping their clothes off at your wedding and going home. It doesn't work. So usually if you bring a young goat home to your wife to say you're sorry, you've just created more problems, not solved any problems. So there's some advice for you if you get nothing else from today's message. Now, what happens? Samson finds out what the reader already knows. As the reader, we know that the bride has been given away. Samson doesn't know that. He finds this out. Now, I think his father-in-law has a reasonable response. I thought you utterly hated us. That's the impression you gave off, right? So, what does he say? Tries to pacify the situation. I'll just give you another daughter. That's fine. Does that work out? And Samson is not satisfied with it. So look, disappointment reigns supreme, even in the first opening verses of this. Samson's disappointed he can't have his wife back. The father's disappointed that Samson's come back and that handing off his other daughter doesn't work. Now notice what Samson's resolve is. This time, I will be innocent of the Philistines' blood on my hands. So let's take a look to see how Samson deals with his disappointment. Verse 4. So Samson went and caught 300 foxes and took torches, and he turned them tail to tail and put a torch between each pair of tails. And when he had set fire to the torches, he let the foxes go into the standing grain of the Philistines and set fire to the stacked grain and the standing grain as well as the olive orchards. Orchards. Then the Philistines said, Who has done this? And they said, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he has taken his wife and given to her his companion. And the Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. And Samson said to them, If this is what you do, I swear I will be avenged on you. And after that, I will quit. And he struck them hip and thigh with a great blow. And he went down and stayed in the cleft of the rock of Edom. So, Samson's wife is gone. What does he do? He catches 300 foxes. I think a better translation of this is jackals. And the reason being is that in the Hebrew, the word for foxes and jackals in in biblical Hebrew is the same word. Foxes live in isolation. Jackals run in packs. And so while it would be difficult to catch 300 either way, catching 300 pack animals would be more feasible than catching 300 isolated animals like foxes. So I think a better translation would be jackals, but in modern Hebrew, the word that's translated for foxes is the same word we find here. That's why most modern translations, I think, say foxes, but jackals is probably better in sight. Now what he does is he ties them tail to tail with a torch in between, and he lets them run wild in the dry fields, lighting everything on fire. That's a pretty normal response, right? To deal with the disappointment that you're experiencing in life. Let's not just be sad and write a love song. Let's destroy a bunch of produce in people's farms lands. Now, for some people, when they read the scriptures, they come to a passage like this and they go, you know what? I don't believe the Bible. This sounds more like myth than truth. Because who would actually do something like this? But I think what we're missing is is the summary aspect of the text. Let me draw an illustration. So let's say Brian and I were catching up today. And I said, Brian, what have you been up to? And he says, oh, last weekend I built a play set for my kids. Hopefully I'm not creating any uh, disappointment in your children's lives and telling the story right now. It's make-believe. So... Brian tells me the story. He says, I I built a play set for my kids last week. My response would not be, that's a lie. That's a myth. You know, because if you really did that, then you would have told me, oh, I went to the store and I bought this and I bought that and I came back and I started assembling and then I forgot something because don't we all forget something when we're building something? And then I went back to the hardware store and I got another trip in and then I went back and I smacked my finger and it hurt really bad and I said very nice words and then I finished building the play set. And here's a picture of it, and I put it on social media, right? I wouldn't say that. That would be an absurd thing to say to Brian if he told me that last week he built a place for his kids, and that's all he said, right? Because it's just a summary statement. Because would you do that to somebody else? If they said, I made Thanksgiving dinner, and you went, liar, I want more details, right? 
Just because the text doesn't go into the details of how he caught the 300 foxes or jackals doesn't mean that it's not true. The text doesn't have to say that he built traps, uh, the series of nights and weeks that he spent in baiting the traps to get them in there. It doesn't have to say all of that for it to be true because it's a summary statement. We can trust the text for what it says. So, notice that the Philistines' response to this incident. They go and they burn the man's house down, his father-in-law's house, killing him and Samson's bride. Do you remember back in the last chapter at the wedding feast what the 30 guards had threatened the bride's with if she didn't find out the riddle to Samson's, the answer to his riddle? What did they say that they were going to do to her? We're going to burn down you and your father's house. And what did she do? She didn't say, I'm going to stand by my husband. She went and wept to her husband until she could get the answer out of him and then told them and then they went to him so they could win the bet, which were then resulted in Samson going down to Ashkelon and killing those 30 guys, which then wrote, resulted in the breakup, then resulted in him coming back, not getting his wife, and then his overreaction to the 300 foxes, and then them deciding to kill her. Look how the whole thing came full circle. And what? In the single decision, that in the initial threat, she did not stand with God's man, her husband, but instead stood with her people, and the same thing came to be. Do you see that? Do you see that cause and effects, that sequence of actions that took place? Talk about extreme disappointment. She sought to save her life through her own means instead of trusting the Lord. So Samson continues with violence as his response. And it says that he struck these Philistines hip and thigh. This is a unique phrase. It's the only time it shows up in the Hebrew text. And it's probably something equivalent to tearing them limb to limb. This is a very violent thing. But notice what, he's, what Samson thinks. That I will result in, this will result in violence one last time, and then I'll quit. So what does he do? See, he went down and stayed in the cleft of the rock of Edom. I think this is Samson's retirement. I think Samson is trying to retire from being a judge of Israel. I've killed more Philistines. My wife's dead. I'm going to go out into the wilderness and be. But the problem is, is that Samson's job as a judge, it's not over yet. And because violence is going to result in more actions. So verse 9, what happens? Then the Philistines came up and they encamped in Judah and made a raid on Lehi. And the men of Judah said, why have you come up against us? And they said, they have come up to bind Samson to do him as he did to us. Then 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Edom and said to Samson, do you not know that the Philistines are rulers over us? What then is this that you have done to us? And he said to them, as they did to me, so I have done to them. And they said to him, we have come down to bind you that we may give you into the hands of the Philistines. And Samson said to them, swear to me that you will not attack me yourselves. They said to him, no, we will only bind you and give you into their hands. We will surely not kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rocks. Okay, now, this is very interesting. So Samson has been a local problem for the Philistines. The Philistines closest to them have been terrorized by him. But by burning all of these fields and then killing all of these Philistines, it's now gone from a local level to a national threat. So now all of the Philistines are concerned with him to the point that they escalate it by attacking nearby Judah. Now, what does Judah say? Judah doesn't say, we're going to stand with our judge, Samson, 
They say, whoa, 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 whoa. How about instead of attacking us, we just go get the guy that you're mad at? Do you see that? Do you see the continual compromise in the text of trying to resolve the problem? They're not going to stand with their judge. They're going to go get their judge. You just want him? We can get him for you. Now, they're a little concerned, right? Because how many men do they send? What does it say? 3,000, right? I mean, Gideon was able to defeat the Midianites with 300. (laughs) Judah sends 3,000 down to get this guy out of retirement. Sorry, Samson. Retirement's not going to go the way that you planned. Anybody experienced that disappointment before? Wow. Now notice what they say. What are you doing to us? And Samson's response is, I just did to them what they did to me. Is that remotely close to true? Is that? No, it's not true at all. But you see how disappointment has changed the way that Samson sees reality. And that's the same thing that it does to us. That it distorts our perspective on what's really real. And so here, he says, okay, I'll go up. But, are you going to kill me? They go, no, we won't kill you. We'll just bind you. He says, good enough. Samson's got a plan. Verse 14. When he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting to meet him. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and the ropes that were on his arms became a flax that has caught fire, and his bonds melted off his hands, and he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, and he put on his hand, and he took it, and with it he struck a thousand men. And Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, have I struck down a thousand men. And as soon as he had finished speaking, he threw away the jawbone out of his hand, and that place was called Ramath Lahi. Now, in the last chapter, the Holy Spirit came rushing upon Samson in two instances. First, when the young lion attacked him in the vineyard, and he was able to rip that lion apart like a lion rips apart a goat. And then it came upon the, the Spirit... He came upon Samson a second time before he went down to Ashkelon and killed those 30 Philistines. This is the first time and the only time that the Spirit of the Lord comes upon Samson. Isn't that interesting that the Spirit of the Lord isn't described as coming upon him when he got those 300 foxes or jackals? And the Spirit of the Lord didn't come upon him when he took those other Philistines from hip to thigh, but this time, when he's bound up, when his life depends upon it, the Lord delivers him. And he kills a thousand Philistines with a jawbone of a donkey. Now this is one of those moments where I'm always very intrigued by the detail of the biblical text. Because what type of jawbone did he grab? Fresh fresh jawbone. Why is that an important detail? Well, not only would it not be brittle and easily break, but if it was very fresh, it would still have the teeth in it, which would be a much more effective weapon in killing a thousand men. I mean, that's a very, very important detail. It's the minutia in the text which causes me to go, I can trust the details of that earlier summary text if it can get this type of detail correct. Now, the Spirit of the Lord empowers him to kill a thousand Philistines. Why? We'll go back to the previous chapter, and when he was pining after that Philistine woman, verse 4 says this, is that the Lord was going to use Samson against the Philistines. That's exactly what he's going to do. And next year... When Amor invites me back again, we'll find out the conclusion of why. So, yeah, mark your calendars. <laughs> now, Ramath Lahi translates roughly to hill of the jawbone. So he is very eloquent in this poem. Jawbone of Ducky, I've struck down a thousand men, and they renamed the place after him. Verse 18. This is very important how the chapter closes. He was very thirsty 
And he called upon the Lord, and he said, You have granted us this great salvation by the hand of your servant, and shall I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? And God split open the hollow place that is at Lahi, and water came out from it. And when he drank, his spirit returned, and he revived. Therefore the name of it was called En Hakor. It is at Lahi to this day. And he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines 20 years. Now this is the very first time that Samson speaks to the Lord. This is the first time that he prays. This is it. There's one more time that it will happen, but this is the first time. And notice what happens. He kills a thousand men, and he's very thirsty. That's fair. I've never done it, but it seems like a reasonable response. But notice that in his prayer... He does not praise God for deliverance, but almost in a questioning manner, challenging the Lord, you have granted this great salvation by the hand of your servant, and shall I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? Talk about ungratefulness. Talk about the way that his disappointment in his life and to this point has shaped and influenced the way that he views the Lord. I mean, a lot of his theology is revealed in this moment. That he's almost shaking his fist at God. You're going to do all of this and now I'm going to die? Now the Lord doesn't send an angel. The Lord doesn't bring a vision. But the Lord does do something that is miraculous. And the ground opens up and water comes forth. Now for my Bible reading friends, going back to the Torah, what does this remind you of? Moses, right? Right? That the Lord miraculously provides water from a rock. And so here, what I think the author of Judges wants the reader to understand is this is that Samson didn't honor his marriage vows. The father-in-law tried getting out of it by giving away his daughter. Samson tried solving it by killing people. The Philistines tried solving it by killing his bride and father-in-law. Judah tried solving it by turning over Samson. Samson tried solving it again by more violence. None of it works. All of it's backwards. But what does the Lord do? The Lord delivers exactly what Samson needs when he needs it. And it's not because of Samson. It's because of who God is. Because God is faithful. You cannot separate God from faithfulness. This is who God is. The same God who delivered Moses in the wilderness deliver Samson this day. Unchanging. Not because of their faithfulness, but because of his faithfulness. And I think this is the very thing that every single person in this narrative has missed. Is that their lives have been defined by disappointment and trying to do things their own way instead of aligning their lives based around this one simple but clear truth. God is faithful. And so I want to ask you a question today. What has been defining you? How have you been viewing the world around you? Has it been through the lens of disappointment? Through unmet expectations? Or has it been through the lens of God's faithfulness? Because when we choose to align our decision making based off of who God is, will disappointment come? Yes. Will it define us? I don't believe so. I want to share a story about a man, you're all going to know his name, but I think he's modeled this very, very well in his life. Anybody heard of Dr. Gary Chapman? If you haven't heard, maybe the five love languages. 
I'm not sure what you know about Dr. Gary Chapman. He's in his 80s now. He's quite spry still. But when he's a young man, as a teenager, down in North Carolina, he was beginning to feel a call on his life to go into full-time vocational ministry. So as a teenager, he gathered his friends together, and he said, would you please pray for the Lord's direction in my life of whether or not I should go into full-time ministry. Now that's pretty refreshing, isn't it? To think about a teenager so sensitive to God's leading in their life that they would gather their friends and their friends would actually gather with them and pray to such end. And as they're praying, Gary senses very clearly, yes, the Lord is leading me into full-time ministry. Now in his mind, full-time ministry at this point is one of two things. You're either going to be a pastor or you're gonna be a missionary. But for Gary, he was pretty certain that being a missionary meant you had to go to a jungle. And if you went to a jungle, there was going to be snakes there. And he was terrified of snakes. So that went right off the table. So like, can't be a missionary, can't handle snakes. So I'm going to go be a pastor. So he goes to his high school Bible teacher, which was at a public high school. So some things have changed, right? And he says, I want to become a pastor. What should I do? And the pastor said, have you ever heard about a place called Moody Bible Institute in Chicago? Gary said, never heard of it. He said, I think it's the place to go if you want to become a pastor. So he sent a letter to Moody. Moody sent back a packet. He applied. He got in. And he left his family for the very first time on a bus to go to Chicago, Illinois. And as he was at Moody, back then a three-year program, he learned a lot more about missions one of the things he learned was is that you could become a missionary and not encounter an unusual amount of snakes. And so he actually even became the chaplain for the mission student group on campus and decided, you know what, actually I think the Lord is calling me into missions. And one of the things that really did it for him was is that he learned that about 90, at this time, 93% of the people trained with the gospel to serve in full-time ministry was located in the United States. But that 93% of the world population that didn't know Jesus as Savior lived outside of the United States. And so he was very conflicted by the statistic that 93% of those trained were in but 93% of those in need were out. He said, I got to go out. And so after he finished Moody, he went to Wheaton, finished his undergrad degree. Then he went to grad school to do intercultural studies. And he met his wife. And his wife was like, I would love to be a missionary too. That's what I want to do. And they were like, this is amazing. And they got married. And as they were finishing grad school, they went to a mission organization. And they said, we're ready to go onto the field. And what we want to do is, is we want to train local people with the Bible so that way they begin to share the word with their people. And they were like, that's a beautiful, beautiful picture of what missions can look like. However, if you really want to be a professor and a teacher and train people up there, you have to go get a doctorate. And you can do it while on the field and taking breaks and hiatus and things like this, this is all pre-internet, remember? And it'll take you decades. Or you can just go right now, get your doctorate, and then we can send you, and you can do this phenomenal work. So Gary was so committed, him and his wife were so committed, they went and they got a doctorate, and they went back to the mission organization, and they said, okay, we've done everything that you've asked, we're ready to go. And the mission organization said, actually... Your wife's health condition puts her at too much of a risk to go overseas. So we have to say no. And they were shocked. They said, but you knew about her health condition before. Yeah, but we've just changed our minds about this. But we think we're going to be okay. We're willing to take the risk. That's okay, but we're not. Can you imagine the disappointment from being a teenager, sensing a call to serve, and here you are a decade plus later with your wife and with this doctorate degree, 
you thinking you're so close to doing exactly what God's called you to do, and red light. No go. So they moved back home. And Gary thought, well, I've got this doctorate. Surely I should be able to go get a job as a professor somewhere. As it turned out, not so easy. 26 places he applied to, 26 no's. Finally, the 27th place said, yeah, we'll hire you to teach the Bible. And so Gary here, he's beginning to teach the Bible in this college, and he's enjoying it, but he realizes something. There's something that's really not that great about being a college professor. Grading papers. It's a bummer. I'm not sure if you know this, but I just started teaching online for Moody. I'm a college professor now. I don't know how this happened. And I want to tell you something. I agree with Gary. It's terrible grading papers. Does anybody here like grading papers? Oh, Gio, you're a freak of nature, man. Amazing. Amazing. Might hire you as my TA, TA, that kind of thing. So Gary lasts one year. And he goes, you know what? I love working with college people, but this grading stuff, it's for the birds. I'm out of here. So he finds a local church nearby. It's a pretty good-sized church, and they want to start the first ever college ministry. And so they hire Gary to be their college pastor. And he loves it. But he realizes, these kids, they got a lot of problems. They're adults, but they're kids, and they need the Word of God. And as he spends a decade doing it, he realizes that there's this whole other generation coming through that's not getting any attention from the church. There's this group of singles in the church, and there's nothing for them. There's things for kids, and there's things for marrieds, and there's things for seniors, but there is nothing for single people. And so Gary asked the church permission, can I start a singles ministry? He said, yeah. So he spent another decade ministering to singles. It was a whole different ball game. And he took everything that he learned from those 10 years working with singles and those 10 years of working with college students and 20 years of doing counseling, and he put it all in a book called The Five Love Languages. And they published. And something strange happened when they published that book. It sold pretty well, but the next year, it sold more. And the next year, it sold more. And the next year, it sold more. And that continued to happen for 15 years. And I'm not sure if you know this or not, but books don't sell more copies year over year for 15 years. It's nearly unprecedented. And so as it's selling and selling and selling, people in Spanish-speaking countries started coming to Gary and said, Gary, we need your book in Spanish. And Gary was like, ah, I don't know. I've, yeah, I have a doctorate degree in intercultural studies. I don't think this is really going to work outside of the United States. And they said, we love your material. Trust us, it'll work. So they published in Spanish. Sold millions of copies. And eventually the demand went to the point where the book is published in 40 different languages. And so now, at this point, Gary's 70 plus years old. Him and his wife are sitting in their living room. They've got a case of boxes open. They're signing copies in all these different languages. And Gary looks up at his wife. And she's crying. Weeping. He's like, honey, what is wrong? She said, I finally understand. He said, understand what? She said, I finally understand why the Lord said no 40 years ago to going on the mission field. Because if we would have gone, we would have reached one group of people. But now, we're reaching hundreds of groups of people. Think about that for a moment. Think about what hung on for 40 years. God, why did you shut the door? Why did you make it seem so clear, but no? 
but finally understand after all of those years, after all those decades. And here's what I see in Gary's story, is that although there was disappointment after disappointment after disappointment, just like you've experienced in your life, they continue to choose to orient their life around this. God is faithful. Could they always see it? No. Could they always feel it? No. But this is what Pastor Dan has said to me and I'm sure to many of you. Think right, do right, and eventually you might feel right. Think right, do right, and eventually you will feel right. And this is the thing that I want you to be really, really straight on your thinking. God is faithful. He cannot be anything else because it's who he is. And if we choose to orient our life around this, will disappointments come? Sure. But they will not be the thing that defines you. They will not be the thing that destroys you. They will not be the thing that mars your life. There will be bumps in the road. There will be heartache. But you will see a way through this life. And whether now or in eternity, you will see this. Purpose. God's hand. And isn't that what we all really want? I mean, ultimately, isn't that what we all really want? Is to get through this life and to hear our Lord and Savior say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and what? Faithful servant. So let's show the Lord what he has shown us. Faithfulness. Will you pray with me? Father, there have been men and women through the ages, men and women through the ages that have chosen to follow you in the most difficult of circumstances. Some people are well known in history and other people we've never heard of. And yet, Lord, it doesn't matter whether or not we've heard of them. The important thing is, Lord, is that they've chosen to respond to you. And Lord, I don't know what each man and each woman is walking through today. Lord, I don't know what hurt and disappointment is heavy on our hearts, on our minds. I don't know what things have twisted and contorted our view of you and ourselves and the world around us from our past. But I pray, Lord, that we'd see you for who you are, God, faithful, that we'd choose to follow your son, Yeshua, and that, Lord, you'd make our path straight. Because, Lord, on our own, we'll always be crooked. On our own, Lord, we will always veer off to the right and to the left, and our feet will find destruction every time, Lord. Surely that. So I ask, Lord, that by the power of your Spirit, that if there's a man or a woman in need of repentance today, because they have not chosen to respond to you as who you are, faithful, that they would repent and experience forgiveness before you. Lord, if there's a way in us that is not right, Lord, that you would reveal it. But that, Lord, today would be a day of reckoning. That this would not be a passing moment where we leave this place, Lord, but that your spirit would work and move. Because, Lord, you desire all of us. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.